Hey everyone, this is Laura, producer and editor of Embark Sessions, here with a content notice for this episode. This episode of Sessions contains sensitive subject matter, including discussions of sexual assault, eating disorders, and the death of a parent. We believe it is crucial to address these issues with empathy and compassion, but we also want to prioritize your emotional well-being. If you feel that these subjects may be triggering or cause discomfort, we encourage you to prioritize your mental and emotional health. If you decide to listen, we'll provide resources in the show notes for anyone who may need support. Please take care of yourself and reach out to trusted individuals or professional services if you require assistance. We appreciate your understanding, and as always, thank you for listening to Sessions. I remember shifting my like brain space to constantly try to protect her uh, from feeling any kind of emotion trying to make sure that everything was always okay. Someone would honk at us in the car and I would immediately like pipe into like, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's okay. We're gonna be okay. And and I was praised for that. And when I look back now, I feel saddened that I was praised for that. Because what I wish that I would have been shown is that it's okay to experience emotion. Mm. It's okay that this is triggering mom. And that doesn't mean that the system is broken. That doesn't mean that we're all going to die. That doesn't mean that um, we're not safe in our body. Welcome, everybody. I'm Dr. Rob Gent, and uh, welcome to another podcast of Sessions. We are so fortunate today to have our guest um, with us that we'll be doing our session with. Her name is Rebecca Tinker. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Rob. Yeah, so Rebecca and I have had a chance to spend some time together, and I was just uh, looking so forward to asking her to join us on the sessions because she's just got so much to offer us. She's a, um, a practicing clinician in the LCSW. She's got some really some amazing focuses, which I'd like her to talk about. But you're uh, located in the uh, the Bay Area and in, in San Francisco. And Rebecca, if you wouldn't mind, t- tell us just a little bit about you. It would be fantastic. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm in private practice here in San Francisco. I specialize primarily in body image, uh, disordered eating. Um, I work with folks on the gender spectrum, also work around issues surrounding sex and sexuality, um, as well as more trauma-informed care. Boy, could there be, uh, certainly I know us dealing here in Embark, we see so many adolescents and young adults. These are just, these are such relevant issues. I, I, you know, I mean, I can only imagine. Have you seen an increase in this population in your practice over the years? Yeah, you know, I, I, I have. Um, I think that the pandemic mm. has definitely created um, or has been a, a big trigger for folks uh, with eating disorders. And so that has definitely led to an uptick in referrals for me in that way. Um, also with the uh, you know issues surrounding gender and trans populations, non-binary populations, and so much going on in our world and our country socially around that also led to um, a big a big uptick um, in clients who struggling in that realm as well. Yeah, so I know that you have this uh, uh, an expertise in this in this population, which is so fantastic. And I guess part of the reason that I wanted to ask you in onto the sessions podcast is uh, the, the whole point of it is to say, hey, what it, what led you to this? Why do you do this? What is your expertise? You know, we we all get into this, like it or not. You know it because of our own personal stuff. It's in our own personal journey. So, Rebecca, I would love to spend some time maybe, you know, exploring a little bit. You have this expertise. I know we talked a little bit about um, for you, the focus was really in related to some personal stuff was trauma, Mm -hmm. loss, um, um, Mm -hmm. some sexual stuff. Uh, If you wouldn't Mm -hmm. mind sharing it with us. Yeah. Where did that where did that really start for you? Yeah, for sure. Thank you for asking that. Um, because the reality is, as a clinician, I feel like 
my model of care is very much informed and guided by my own experience um, and has been, yeah, primarily about uh, learning who I am separate from the world around me. And it's so hard to untangle ourselves from these ideas and images and structures and needs, desires, expectations of the environment that encircles us. Um, I feel like my journey started in kind of two different places. Um, one, and when I was four, I was sexually assaulted by my cousin, um, which was a very, yeah, obviously traumatizing experience that I hid deep in the synapses of my brain, hoping that they would be pruned at some point. And I, I hid from them for a long time. Um, right, and, and for good reason, right? It was not safe to remember that for me. Um, this is a cousin I was going to continue seeing a lot over the years. And so I needed to hide from it for my own safety. Okay, you're saying, I'm just, this is so amazing. At four years old, you have this abusive situation that's sexual with a, you know, a, a family member, if you will. I mean, I just can't imagine what that's like because so many of us would want to normalize it. Like, well, you're just four, you'll forget about it. It'll prune away, like you're saying. Um, I, I just can't imagine how that must have affected you, even at four years of age. Yeah, yeah, it definitely um, made me feel really unsafe in my body. And um, I didn't, I don't think that I realized that for a long time. I think that I found safety in my athleticism and in my play and within my family system. Um, but then that safety again was kind of ripped away when my dad passed away right before my seventh birthday. And that um, that continued to linger. It was, of course, the process of his passing was deeply traumatic and that, you know, my little six-year-old mind was trying to keep him alive by making him happy and making him laugh and wanting to conjure aliveness again. I could like see in his eyes this like, more confusion and more fading and that was super scary. And my approach was to like cling and grasp and get close. Um, and then when he passed, I, yeah, this like lack of safety and this fear really became very strong hmm. inside of me. Um, were were and, you conscious of, was this a conscious type of thing or you were looking back more subconscious or? You know, I think it's so hard to say. I, I want to say it was more subconscious. However, I do very viscerally remember, you know, my, my mom, rightfully so, was in her own grief and depression after my dad passed away. And I remember feeling so terrified for her. Like I thought that I was going to then lose her. I thought that she was going, I don't know if I, when I was like that young at age of seven, thought that she was going to take her life. But I did think, oh, like she's not okay. Mm. And the family system is not okay because she keeps crying. And I remember shifting my like brain space to constantly try to protect her uh, from feeling any kind of emotion, trying to make sure that everything was always okay. Someone would honk at us in the car and I would immediately like pipe into like, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's okay. We're going to be okay. And, um, and I was praised for that. And when I look back now, I feel saddened that I was praised for that. Because what I wish that I would have been shown is that it's okay to experience emotion. Mm. It's okay that this is triggering mom. And that doesn't mean that the system is broken. That doesn't mean that we're all going to die. That doesn't mean that um, we're not safe in our body. But I was so afraid that we just were not safe in our body. You are not so if I can just I'm just this is such an amazing journey, uh, Rebecca. So I'm just trying to understand at six to seven, you lose your dad to cancer. And then, of course, understandably, your mom has a, an immense amount of grief and loss in her own life. 
And then the way family systems often do, one of one of the children compensates and becomes parentified in a hurry, mm-hmm. and you become the 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 safety mechanism. But yeah, and I actually, I I actually think that it wasn't that I was parentified because I'm the youngest of all. I'm the youngest of seven, mm. and I, so I I actually then just became the thing that everyone focused on. And was like, make sure that Becca doesn't act out. Make sure that Becca doesn't. And so I felt like I was like scrutinized a lot or like objectified a lot in that of like, make sure that she doesn't, you know, do something crazy that then will like make mom upset or will like create rupture within the family system. And so I found myself trying to just make myself really, really small. So that we could focus our energy more on like, is mom okay, rather than focusing the energy on me. Um, and so I just, yeah, got myself super, super, super small and hid outside in the yard a lot or like in my room with all my stuffed animals. <laughs> did it, yeah. in, in at that point in time, I can't help, did, did it work? Did did you make yourself small? Did people not notice yeah. you as much? Were they kind of, you know, I, I just fascinated. By well, that. I fit the mold that they needed. What I imagined they needed me to be, I did fit that mold. I was gentle and I was compassionate and I said yes to everything. Hmm. And I didn't, yeah, I, it wasn't until then adolescence that I started to feel like kind of ragey and push back against that because before I think I lost sense of boundary and I didn't know where like I began and someone else ended. I just felt very merged and it was this like murky kind of spilling space of um, really not knowing fully who I was because I was just fitting the mold of like be quiet, be gentle, be sweet, be cuddly, be your athletic self, because that's where you thrive. That's where you're bringing other people joy. The thing like, oh, look what Becca can do. She can hold herself up on the pull-up bar for longer than everyone else in the school, or she can, or whatever it was, you know? Or she's saying yes to everyone, to play with every single person on the playground. Like, how sweet is she? How nice is she? But that, rec- uh, that recognition at some level is reinforcing, right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Totally. Yeah. So it becomes yeah. at least an aspect of what's rewarding to you is doing those things. So I'll keep saying yes. It perpetuates it, right? Right. Which then was very much a trigger of the eating disorder that I then had, like, beginning in adolescence through young adulthood because – I, you know, in childhood was very petite and still quite petite. But of course, then like I hit puberty and my sexual characteristics started to come out more. I was getting breasts. I had more like, you know, as most girls do through puberty, got like started to gain weight in certain areas, didn't look as, I mean, I was always athletic, but didn't look as tiny and athletic as I did pre-puberty. And then it was this sense of like, oh my God, I have to restrict or I have to over-exercise. I have to make myself small again because that's where people needed me to be. That's where I was praised. My worth is within that. My worth isn't like this new body. And then people would comment, oh, looks like you're gaining weight or, oh, but I remember an older cousin saying one time, like, um, like, it looks like you have little Hershey kiss boobs or something like something in this way of like very objectifying in my body and feeling so, uh, like, oh my God, this isn't okay. This is like, I'd wear sports bras to try and like hide the fact that I, I had this budding like woman form. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And can I ask, I mean, you're doing such a great job of articulating it, Rebecca. I just can't help but think of how many how many listeners are probably resonating with this. Certainly, I know that's mm-hmm. part of your career. I, if I can ask, how was your mom during this whole period? How was you and your mom? Um, my mom and my relationship 
um, really struggled in my adolescence. I was pushing back a lot. Mm-hmm. And then, and I felt so guilty for it, but I also had no sense of how to, how to step, like I did really had no idea on how to hold boundaries without just being com- totally mean. Just so mean and so angry and pushing back against all the boundaries. But then I would apologize, like, oh God, my apologies were just like so <laughs> <laughs> profuse, <laughs> as we say. So yeah. In a lot of ways. Um, I would just feel so badly. Um, but I also had no idea how not to push back. And I really cut her out from my life in so many ways. And I also, I also was really afraid of how, how she felt about me getting older. And I think that that was my own projection in some ways of the older I am and the further we are away from when my dad was here. And that felt super scary to have to know that I recognize that, but then to imagine her recognizing that. And the more like I remember when I got my period, I didn't tell my mom because I was so afraid of what would then come up for her. And and it's true when she did find out, however she found out, I don't know. Um, she, she was really, she was so pissed. Oh my God, she was so mad at me. And it was validating then of like, right, I can't tell you things. I, I have to keep hiding. Um, when in reality, she was mad because I was hiding. Um, our relationship is is amazing now. It's really wonderful now. But then it was, yeah, it was it was not great. It was definitely not great. Well, and I'm sure I'm sure for your mom, it's it came out as anger, like you. But I can't imagine even the profound sense of maybe guilt or shame, even for your own mom, right? Like, right, like right. oh. oh. I don't have the relationship with my daughter that I, I wanted to. What, what was, if I can ask, uh, you know, you're one of seven siblings. How do your, are your siblings playing a part? I mean, that there's, I'm sure there's some years between. I, I just, I'm so curious. Yeah, um, there's quite a few years between. <laughs> my oldest siblings were um, uh, adopted by my dad. Um, they're all blood related siblings from Ethiopia and my and then I have one sister who's um blood related to me and she's a year and 10 months older than I am and she you know all my siblings really after my dad passed away like stepped in uh especially my oldest brother like my three older brothers uh really stepped in as parents in some ways um or dad, like dad roles to me in some ways, especially as I got older. Um, but but my my sister who's blood related, she I think really took on this feeling of needing to be my mom's partner. Oh, interesting. And then I lost my my like buddy. And then I felt super because my sister older than my blood related sister is ten years older than me. Wow. And so there was this like huge gap. And so the only other kid then was no longer my like comrade mm. and was like constantly tattletaling on me or like putting me in my place or I was a pretty quiet kid and she's, she's an actress. She was very, she's still an actress and is very loud and um, makes her opinion known. And I remember in my childhood, she, um, my mom would be like, all right, girls, what do you want for dinner? And my sister would turn to me and be like, what do you want for dinner? And I would whisper to her, I want mac and cheese. And then she'd like go and tell my mom, we want like, maybe say mac and cheese or maybe say something completely different. I don't know. But I like was, yeah, it was this like, let's, let's just say whatever will be easiest. Like my sister definitely took that role mm. and I kind of was quiet. <laughs> That yeah, makes sense. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So, so walk me back through. So, your beginning is in your adolescence to find a voice. I guess is what you're saying. But it's it's yeah. rearing its 
head is anger and rage and profuse apologies. And then, it, yeah, how, how does life look at that moment in time for you? Um, you know, I, like middle school was super hard. Middle school was like, I, I didn't know who I was. I was really like floundering and like had no clue. Um, and going to high school, I switched from in middle school. I was at a Catholic school, which really did not bode well for my like anger parts and also my like desire to individuate. And I was pushing back and I was constantly getting in detention and um, speaking back in class and being a brat. And um, I was just like trying, I was trying to find myself in like all the different ways. And then I went to a liberal arts high school and um, that was super beneficial. My teachers were really like mentors in a lot of ways um, and really held space for me and really reflect, like, because it was such a small school, they they knew what party I had been to at the weekend, like over the weekend and they knew, and I respected them. I really respected them. And um, I, <laughs> yeah, I, to like go along with that like profuse apologies. I remember freshman year of high school, there had been some party and I was on track um, and we were going to state and so we had regionals and then state and um, there was a party after the prom, which I wasn't allowed to go to the prom, but I did go to the after I snuck out of my house and I went to the after party and um, I, Got in trouble by my mom when I came home, but that was like kind of besides the fact. But then at school the next day, they made, or whatever the next day was at school, um, they made an announcement for like all the students on the track team to like come to a meeting. We went to this meeting, like, we know about this party and we know that some of you were there and we're going to give you guys the opportunity to come to us and let us know if you were there or not. Mm -hmm. Because technically you're not allowed to, go to parties or drink during track season or whatever that was. And of course, no one goes to to say that they were there, but I did. <laughs> and I was like, I was there. You probably already know. And they were like, no, we didn't. Okay, thank uh, you. We did not the, bluff, the bluff worked, yeah. Uh, but, um, so then I like couldn't, I couldn't run in state. So was, um, they like when when you admit to something like that or when you're found out about something like that, you have to skip the next meet and the next meet regionals or whatever. And yeah, so um, yeah, but adolescence in high school was very much me finding myself and having really awesome mentors and people that held me accountable oh. and that I could, I feel like with my mom, I, it was so hard to push explore my boundaries and push on her because I was so resentful mm. of her grief and her sadness growing up. I think that, and so resentful of like, I think there was a part of me too, that was like, maybe my dad died. And this was like a unconscious thought, subconscious thought of like, maybe my dad died because you weren't enough of a wife. And that goes back to my own, my sexual assault. Mm. Cause my cousin at that time had said, this is how you have to be a wife. This is what makes you a good wife. Those are his, the only words that I remember him saying. Wow. And then I remember thinking, well, maybe my mom wasn't a good enough wife and or a good enough partner. And that's why my dad had to die or something. So I had a lot of resentment toward her. Um, but then I, so I didn't feel like when I would try and push back, she would just cry or she would just break down. And I didn't have that strong wall to fully push on. And I mean, I think my mom did absolutely the best that she could given her circumstances, you know, and um, has done an amazing job since, since then. But um, but I had like in my in my high school, the teachers and the coaches that I needed to be able to fully push back on. I knew that I could I remember with my soccer coach, who was also my track coach. Um, I felt like I knew that I could scream at him mm. and he, and I did. I like remember after doing like a, a soccer game, he pulled me off 
and was yelling at me for something. And I just screamed at him back like profanities. And he was like, okay, let's go for a walk. And we like went for a walk and like, he just like fully held the space and like, wasn't mad at me, was just like, this is unexpected. You can't treat me like this. And let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. And I was like, oh my God, like that was the boundary that I needed. And I like felt so much more contained. It's, um, it's so amazing. I love what you're highlighting, Rebecca, is that as kids and adolescents, we need really secure people in our lives that can handle yeah. and are resilient in order to allow us to feel that safety. It's so, yeah, it's totally. so amazing. Yeah. Totally, totally. I'm so yeah. glad that you had that. And can I ask, were, was the eating disorder occurring during this time as well? Was that, or was that after? You know, I, I was constantly ruminating about my body. Mm -hmm. I was constantly wanting to make myself smaller. I wasn't, like, I was in and out of, like, actively uh, restricting and then not restricting and then restricting and then not restricting. And I, it was as though I was, I like, I had, I had significant body image, but I, I didn't quite have the understanding of what I could do about it. And then it wasn't until college that I was like, oh, I'm on my own. I'm not in my mom's home. I can not eat whenever I want to not eat. And, and so I did that. And, and it worked very well for me at the time. Um, and, and then, you know, when I would go home for the summers, I, um, I remember especially the summer between my freshman and sophomore year of college. Oh my God, I was so intensely anxious because I had these disordered eating patterns that then I had to figure out how to engage with in my home environment mm -hmm. where we're supposed to be having family dinners all the time. And when I was really little, um, I would cry before and during every single meal. And I hated family meals and I hated, I just hated eating. And, um, and it was like that, that part of me got, reignited again it was like i would get anxious and i'd start crying and i wouldn't want to sit at the table or like my family would plan um like a big dinner out at a restaurant um because like my brother would be in town or something and i would be like i can't i can't go like you don't understand like i can't go they don't have food that i want or i'm not going to be hungry or i had recently started taking Adderall for ADHD and I would blame it on that. And I would say, well, I'm on my medication, so I can't eat during that time. Mm. It'll give me a stomach ache or it'll. And so I like got away with eating small amounts and no one really said anything. No one was like, are you okay? Despite the fact that I was dropping significant weight over the years, I think beginning maybe my Junior year of college, there started to be some like, wait, is this how I really want to be living my life? Because I was starting to feel more, you know, I had a strong community of friends, but my eating disorder voice was so loud that it felt then super hard for me to actually connect with my community and connect with my friends. And I felt this part that was just disconnected hmm. um yeah. and i was like i don't being disconnected doesn't feel good i need to feel and so i like had my own kind of reality check in that moment and then also at that time i had sh i had switched my major to creative writing specifically poetry and i started writing a bunch and that and i had an amazing poetry professor um and he really just supported my writing so much in ways of like allowing me to be vulnerable and allowing me to talk about this claustrophobia and this like stuckness and this sensation. I remember saying in multiple different ways of like wanting to rip my skin off. Mm. 
because there was this like crinkly restless feeling that I couldn't get away from. Um, and, and he like really helped me find words to understand the experience I was going through and all the different layers of it. And so that was like one shift. And then, um, there was another shift. Well, I guess it was senior year of college. I started doing a lot of meditation and a lot of yoga and I was waking up far earlier than all of my friends and, um, going to a yoga class and doing meditation and maybe going for a run at some point and then just writing, like writing my thesis. And my thesis was a creative writing, a, a long poem or prosy format, uh, really about my own life. And it, and that journey really helped me, especially the like yoga and meditation of creating more introspection into myself and like really becoming more aware of my senses and like, can I just feel wind on my skin or can I just feel my fingertips or can I feel my seat in the chair or can I feel this muscle stretching and recognizing that my thoughts about that muscle stretching were just as much me as the muscle that self is me and creating more of a relationship from the gaze of like the muscle itself, like from the embodied space itself. And I had really built the gaze of seeing the muscle, but I had not really built the experience or built the, the muscle, so to speak, of being inside of it. And I, I was able to shift my lens to be like, wait, can I go inside and really be in that muscle as it's stretching rather than observing the muscle as it's stretching. And that helped me to gain a different kind of appreciation or acceptance um, of being in my body. I won't, I, I really push back against the verbiage of like body positivity because that shows them that there's like, it's still objectifying the body. And I, um, I knew that objectifying the body in any way, whether it was positively or negatively, was, was not going to serve me at all. And so it was like, can I just be inside of it? And can, and like, how do I feel inside of it? Not how, how do I feel about it, but how do I feel inside of it? And gaining a different appreciation for my flexibility or my strength or um, my able bodiness um and and that was a big shift and after i graduated college i went on to to study yoga and meditation um and i did that for like 10 months and became a yoga teacher and um and meditation teacher and that was what really brought me into eating disorder care as a clinician as well of like bringing people back to the body's experience because I started working with clients um, from that from that more somatic lens before I actually got my um, my MSW yeah so you I, I really appreciate the words it wasn't about judging it was about being I, I yeah. really appreciate that because so much of our just we're hardwired for ob objectifying even mm -hmm. ourselves. And so that is so valuable, Rebecca. And I'm also hearing you say, as my journey continued, there was this evolution that because I've felt some healing, um, I'm going to, I can give back. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And you've, you going through your journey and as you create your own healing, you reach this point where you recognize that you can start to give back and, and heal others. And then maybe talk a little bit from that point on, how has that transpired into just a, a career in, in seeing the clients you have now? Yeah. Um, well, it started with, uh, I started working at um, 
a clinic in Vermont called uh, Vermont Center for Integrative Therapy. Right, right. And we right. specialize more in working um, with folks struggling with disordered eating and body image. Um, and I was leading their um, uh, the yoga programming and meditation programming for um, all of our IOPs, the uh, intensive outpatient programs and then also doing one-on-one -on -one and also leading workshops and immersions mm. um, using the modalities of mindfulness and um, yoga as the primary interventions at that time. But then while I was there, I went, I did uh, my level one and level two of internal family systems training um, by Dick Schwartz. And he wasn't the trainer at the training of other people. I don't remember their names. Um, but that was also super informative for like building my own language as a talk therapist, so to speak. Um, and then it was after that that I went on to grad school. Um, and when I went to grad school, I actually left the eating disorder clinic and started working in child psychiatry at University of Vermont. And then I was also teaching within the behavior change minor at the University of Vermont and using mindfulness as therapeutic interventions. Mm. Um, and yeah, and that, and then it was after I graduated grad school um, that I then moved to uh, San Francisco and started my own private practice here. Yeah. And I would imagine with your experience and your expertise, it probably didn't take line long to build a clientele, <laughs> I would imagine. I, I, uh, I, I started my practice in San Francisco at the very beginning of the pandemic, and my caseload was full within probably like two months. <laughs> oh, my goodness. What a need yeah. during that time. Yeah. 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 Especially with the on, online, it, it actually served to be so beneficial as, and especially for my adolescent clients, because they then have the option, because within Zoom, you know, you can, there's the chat box as well. Right. And all my adolescents are expert texters. <laughs> and so if they didn't want to say something out loud, because their parent was in the other room, they would just send it in the, in the chat box. Oh, wow. And so we would be like making all the faces on the Zoom call, but then like, like you know, sending the actual messages are like doing a lot of the dialogue in the text box because there was this fear of are my parents listening yeah. um and establishing that uh i believe especially with adolescents building the attachment and the connection therapist to client is so imperative for anything else to ever happen so in the first many sessions it's just us almost shooting the shit kind of to be like, Hey, you can trust me. Right. Like I'm your, I'm your ally here. I'm your peer here. We are in this together. And then it's, it's at that point that then they're like, okay, now like you don't have any agenda for me. You're not saying I have to heal in this one particular way. You're saying all of my parts are allowed to be here and you're not shaming them. And now we can go forward and have a conversation. Cause I trust you. Cause I trust you. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So profound. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. t tell me, I just really some two quick questions that I'm curious about is, um, how did the repair go with your mom? Um, <clears throat> is repair the right word? I don't know. Maybe that's. Yeah, I, huh. um, I don't know if we had a moment of repair, but we absolutely have had a lot of moments of deep connected conversation and discourse mm -hmm. where I have felt more comfortable sharing about my experiences growing up. And I think for a long time, I felt very afraid to have conversations about my adolescence and childhood with her for the same reasons why I felt afraid to have conversations with her back then of like, she's going to get upset or I'm going to hurt her feelings or something. And um, our relationship now is very much one where I don't, I, I have 
established clear boundaries of I'm not here to take care of you, but I am here to support you just as you're here to support me. And once I really understood my own boundaries and like where I started and where she ended, that has allowed me to then be able to open up to her mm. and, um, and share with her my own vulnerabilities or like call her when I'm in a moment of like suffering or like hardship and, and then, and she'll hold space. But I think because the boundaries between us were so blurred for such a long time, that's why I couldn't, I didn't feel comfortable going to her when I was suffering because I thought that it would just add to hers, but because there's that boundary now and I know who I am separate from her, I know that we're different beings. It's made it so much easier. And I think that that also came from her allowing me to just be me, especially through college, like through the ends of college, not like there was not, there was no getting in trouble. There was no like, um, she really saw me just like growing and just, and then again after college and like making my own choices and fumbling and then standing back up and then fumbling and standing back up and um, she gained a different kind of respect hmm. for me as an individual maybe or maybe she always had respect but I started to be able to see oh mom respects me or oh mom mom trusts me in, in being my own autonomous individual out there in the world and now that means i can i can go to her when i am suffering or i can go to her when i when i am celebrating and i don't have to stay in hiding oh so wonderful thanks for sharing that rebecca and my last question is just uh, just because i am curious i'd imagine you don't ever really arrive but how is your journey with your self-identity how is my journey with my self-identity? I feel confident in my identity. I feel um, I feel confident in yeah, in, in who I am and in what I know. And from I feel like I've moved from a space of like beginner's mind and trying to like constantly be learning and growing and um, and that, I think that that then allows me to be confident in in my moment and in my identity as I am because I just fully acknowledge to myself that I don't know everything. And I think for a long time, I felt like I had to be perfect and I had to know everything. And I was ashamed of all that I didn't know. And now, like, I think that I've entered more of a space of curiosity into the world of like, yeah, there's so many things I don't know and that's kind of exciting. Hmm. I don't want to know everything because if I know everything, then like, why am I still here? I feel like I sh should be dead by that point. <laughs> if I know everything, like if there's no point. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I have to say, uh, R Rebecca, you've uh, certainly made an imprint on me that you're uh, this, it's a building. Like your confidence that you describe allows you to be vulnerable and I can't tell you how much myself, but also the listeners appreciate that vulnerability and the confidence in the story and to recognize that there is healing. Frankly, there, mm -hmm. there is healing. And now you've dedicated your career to helping others. And I imagine it helps you as well. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Well, Rebecca, this has been such an incredible time. Thank you so much. And I, I know there's just so much value and just everything you've said and the listeners, and I mean, from everything to understanding, what does it mean to be a confident, safe caregiver to children and adolescents and be in that safe place has been so incredible. So, Rebecca, I'm going to go out on a limb. I'd love to follow up if you're up for it. We may do a part two and talk about more about your current practice because we just we didn't really even touch on this vast, just enormous, complex issue of gender identity and how co-occurring um, co-occurrences of eating disorders with minority group and marginalized groups is just exponentially really high. So I'd love yeah, to Yeah, I would love to, 
I'd love to do that. Yeah, great. terrific. Well, we're going to have you back. So thank you for joining. This has uh, been Sessions Podcast uh, with Rebecca Tinker. Thank you so much. And please access this podcast wherever you do. If it's Apple or wherever, wherever you do that, please look us up. And we look forward to uh, you joining us on our next session. Rebecca, thank you. Thank you, Ralph.